good evening all and uh, i'm urvinder and thank you so much for joining this uh, much anticipated webinar on telemedicine its benefit and of course remote patient monitoring uh telemedicine was considered futuristic and experimental some years ago but it is the reality today uh it is now emerging as an important tool for convenience as well as specialized healthcare particularly for patients in remote locations with limited access to standardized healthcare services uh even though telemedicine cannot be a solution to all these problem it can surely help decrease the burden of healthcare system to a large extent uh we have today dr krishna prasad uh, as a speaker to discuss more on telemedicine and its application considering the current scheme of thing uh dr prasad is a renowned consultant anesthesiologist and intensivist trained at pgmr chandigarh uh also dr prasad finished his frca and obtained ccst from uk uh dr prasad is also the director of axon anesthesia associates and exs telemedics hyderabad uh so thank you so much for uh, giving this talk today sir uh the floor is all yours and we look forward to hearing your inputs on telemedicine uh just one point to the participants uh you can ask your questions on the chat window which is available on the top and we'll take them towards the Q&A session, which is scheduled towards the end. So, the floor is all yours. Good evening, everyone, and uh, wish you all a happy Easter or whatever remains of it. Um, um, I'm talking from a position of what is telemedicine because we actually run a very intensive care service, and um, we are actually monitoring patients, and um, um, they are at distant sites, not in Hyderabad. I'm based in Hyderabad, and um, So when I'm not giving anesthesia, I'm doing intensive care. So both on site as well as online. So um, so again, so telemonitoring and telemedicine is a passion, and I think it is important that everybody should know uh, how to do it. So here goes. So what are the facts now? So the facts I'm talking about uh, telemedicine in the perspective in general, and as well as in the perspective of this current case scenario where we have. Uh, covid 19 um pandemic going on and what the world is being doing and what we are doing in india at the moment so the facts um healthcare workers lives have been lost that's a fact there is lack of data in india there is no standardization of protocols yet in most of the places that are being managed there is no unification of care and we have diverse geographical sites so Hashtag scarce resource. Now, what is the most scarce resource here? It's not money any longer. It is healthcare workers. So I can safely say that never in the history of mankind has the lives of the entire humanity depended on the lives of so few. Look after the healthcare workers. How do we go about doing it? Now, this is the Medscape Anesthesiology website, which actually shows um, the a memoriam page where healthcare workers who have died from covid-19 it extends 11 pages and it keeps on getting uh, updated every day and there is actually if you can look at it there is a um, uh, resource where you can actually upload uh, the names of the people or colleagues who have died it's a sad situation uh, but this is what is happening and now this is if you see this has been the uh, fame unfamous situation where um this video went viral the head of the wuchang hospital in china who was a neurosurgeon he was managing the ic in the hospital and he died of covid-19 and his wife uh was um, the head nurse and she and she was following this and this is the current state of affairs around the world uh, i'm very proud on the extreme top left corner is a junior from pgi chandigarh who is the uh, frontline warrior in new york that was his intubation day and him kitted up like this for 6 hours um completely to intubate at least 10 to 12 patients in the intensive care unit per day and the below that is the negative pressure units that are set up temporarily to uh, suck out the air from those intensive care you know to get rid of the as possible as much as possible amount of virus in the air their time magazine for the first time in its 100 year history set up an any statist on its cover in the front line worker and the other pictures 
show what is happening in the intensive care units look and look and look at the ply boards and how they have been separated the equipment has been separated from people so that they can be managed behind this huge uh, temporary wall and this is the way the intensive care unit works now so you have to, you can imagine the situation there at the moment that is going on this is in new york city now this is the covid-19 hospital in bhubaneswar very pristine very clean till now no admissions yet to be inaugurated but look at it from a different perspective if when it is full the amount of virus in the air people are coughing people are sneezing people are breathing out talking and they are giving out virus in the air we can look at the concentration of viruses in the atmosphere and you these the entire set of people we could not take the entire uh, photograph of all the beds in this hall this has no negative pressure that means viruses still exist inside this the entire set of the people have to be fed and watered medicines given temperatures taken they have to be fed and watered three times a day and who is going to go in and stay there and these are not the sort of people who can walk up to a window and collect their plate and get fed because many of them will be on oxygen and too weak to move around so what are you going to do how many people will be willing to go in and get exposed to this so so what is the data and statistics we now know the number of dead is escalating in india the last 260 i think but we do not know what are the demographics of that why are they dying of what are they dying was any patient an autopsy done on anybody what tissue samples taken is there a centralized repository of this data that we can look back and learn from this and change our technology change the way we manage them nothing now america suffers from the same problem now this is econarc data which is the intensive care national audit and research center in the london uh when i was working there we used to fill the data religiously for every patient and now it is done automatically and you can look at the data that is coming out i don't know if it is very clear but if you can see it is the amount of data that is available the age at admission the mean the uh, what is the gender what is the medical history of this patient were they able to live without assistance and were the what were the comorbidities what is the acute severity of these agents and this is updated virtually every day and then they tell us what is the capillary may occur that is what is the survival of these patients the patients not receiving mechanical ventilation all the patients and patients receiving mechanical ventilation first 24 hours how many organs were involved this is what we need in these patients and for us to know this if 1.4 billion people are going to be protected and learned now what is the what is the proportion of uh, specialist doctors for us the indian society of critical care medicine has around 13000 members registered around 40% of them are fully qualified that means you have around 5000 qualified intensivists for 1 billion people same thing if indian society of anesthetists has 33000 registered members well some of them don't live in this country some people have retired some people must have died by now because some of them are life members but if you assume that all of them are alive you have one any cities for 30000 people you know why did i put these two uh, specialties up because when people are sick and ill inside the intensive care unit these are the people who are going to look after them the anesthetists are going to secure your airway so that you can be ventilated that is an inherent skill of the anesthetists and the intensivists are going to look after you so you can imagine what we are dealing with the the numbers that we are dealing with we do not have enough numbers we have increased our intensive care beds to around 10 to 11000 in by 11000 or so but still at the end of the day you only have these people who can look after them so we are spread quite thin so healthcare professionals are at the front line of the covid-19 epidemic response and they have the highest risk of infections so the people who are dying there happen to be intensivists and anesthetists because when you are actually looking at the uh, putting a tube into people's throat you get an aerosol of the oxygen that of the patient that you are intubating and uh, that you breathe the high bolus or uh, in the injection of virus into your system 
then telehealth and telemonitoring can help to mitigate this risk by minimizing face-to-face -face interactions. This is where I'm coming from. Now, what does the WHO say? The WHO say gave out a statement saying that first, all, all countries must prioritize protecting the healthcare workers. Second, the communities must actively work to protect the people who are most at risk. The global community must protect most vulnerable countries by doing everything possible to contain the pandemic and minimize the spread. So this is the directive given by the WHO. What does telemonitoring do? The telemonitoring services, as TMS means, is actively protects the healthcare worker by reducing the non-acute patient provider interactions. You go in into those rooms only when necessary. It can assist communities by protecting the high-risk community high risk population. For example, somebody has got heart disease, somebody has got renal failure, or is on a chemotherapy, we can actually monitor them and see that they are not developing symptoms and they can be moved to a facility as quickly as possible. Now, there are countries with ample staffing, like Germany is providing the staffing requirements to uh, Italy and Spain because they have uh, a, a larger uh, physician ratio as compared to the overwhelmed doctors in Italy and Spain. Cuba is actually flying doctors to um, Spain and also doing a remote monitoring of those patients. So these uh, countries with ample staffing can actually help countries with limitation staffing using the telemedicine services. So we always talk about flattening the curve and of the demand for health services. We are tied up, we are in lockdown simply because we don't want to overwhelm the healthcare services. We, over, let, we rather than uh, immediately put pressure on these services, we are extending it over a period of time. But eventually the same number of people will get ill. So in, in how do we flatten the curve? The flattening the curve is telemonitoring will directly influence flattening the curve because we are going to monitor them at home or in the wards so that they don't come and influence, become a, a, a pressure on the scarcely available intensive care services. They, we can monitor self and home isolated patients and mild cases can be monitored at, at a safe and a distant monitoring site. We can give expert opinions on that, and teleradiology can be done so that people can report those x-rays, which form an important part of the diagnosis. That is, we can have cross-border experiences, so I can know what is happening in Maharashtra, I can observe what is happening in Gujarat. There are barriers now, and most importantly, telepsychiatry is being used for giving mental health support to the patients and the healthcare workers. Because we all know that isolation is a major problem in quarantine. There's nobody to talk to. You are inside a mask. If you take off the mask, you're breathless. So you can't speak to anybody. Walk, talking is a very, very difficult task because you're breathless. So the healthcare workers don't have to unnecessarily enter the room for taking simple things like taking the temperature or um, uh, what we call checking the pulse oximetry or recording their notes. All this can be done remotely and that can be established. We can establish two-way communications. We can put cameras where you can actually talk to people and we can swivel, zoom the cameras to look at the faces, look at the monitors, etc. The it, it has another sinister reason, actually. Uh, the, the relatives are not allowed to see the dying relatives anymore. There is no closure. And most of the goodbyes are being told on a tele system. People come to the outside the ICU and they sit in front of the camera and they talk and they that's the last meeting they have with the relatives. So there is a lot that can be done. And now we now know that remote practitioners cannot change the settings on the equipment. That is going to change because the first thing that the federal FDA has done is that to remove this clause that uh, equipment can be uh, <clears throat> equipment can be monitored can be changed over time from a distance. That is what they have they have done. So if we uh, we have to understand that this is a major change that has happened, and it also provides some amount of dangers as well. That uh, syringe pumps. Uh, ventilator settings can actually be changed remotely now. All these days it was not possible by law. That has been lifted. But this is going to change. So that has to be looked into. So one of the problems of isolation is, uh, of quarantine is isolation. 
And this isolation has to be addressed. And the only way we can address it is by telemedicine. People can speak to each other well. So what are the other benefits? Now, the government is actively recruiting retired physicians to come back to work. But we have to understand that the COVID-19 actually affects the elderly. If you're more than 50 years old, the chances of you dying of COVID-19 are more. So these retired physicians are a vulnerable age. And these people, we have to remember, many of them have not actually worked in an intensive care unit. For them, the tele-ICU is a safe haven. They can sit there and monitor a lot of patients. And that would be the right and ideal thing for them. So, but tele-ICU is only part of the entire response. It's not going to completely change the way the pandemic works. Still, people have to stay at home. We have to quarantine. We have to maintain social distancing, try out new drugs. And what, what it does do is that it improves the capacity of trained people to handle the pandemic scientifically and without inhibition. The scare that I might be infected at ground zero, that is where the infection is. How does telemonitoring help? First and foremost, it prevents fragmentation of data. Our data is fragmented. Even though the health ministry does an admirable job, it has got a dashboard, but it takes a lot of effort to collect all that data. You depend on people reporting the right amount of deaths to the right amount of intensive care reports to go to that place, and we, we know how that works. But still, there is fragmentation. We, we depend on a lot, but, and you need, but you need unification of treatment. This is important because when we are dealing with a large number of patients, uh, simple statistics don't work anymore. The unification of treatment is needed. That somebody is trying hydroxychloroquine, somebody is trying uh, uh, plasma, somebody is trying some of the new medicines. Yesterday, somebody was speaking about using prophylactic rifampicin. <clears throat> Where are we going? So there is a unification of treatment that is needed. And at the same time, when you're running tele-ICU and tele-intensive care and telemedicine, you can rapidly deploy trials and bring in data to the front very quickly. You can do a rapid, if a particular, let us say, a mode of ventilation is not working, we can do a rapid course correction because we are all getting centralized data. And only when you get data, you can deploy AI. Otherwise, it's going to be garbage in and garbage out. So this is how telemonitoring is going to help in a larger scale. So if it's, it's a general impression that tele-ICUs can only be done for one hospital. It is not. You can do it for one hospital, definitely, but it's like a one big ICU in the sky. So there is no geographical barriers anymore. You can actually take intensive care units from different sites and put them in a command center and people can watch over it safely. That doesn't remove the requirement for people on site but it actually reduces the impact of those people on that site. That is the important thing. But here, as you see, that I, I have tried to illustrate it, that you have these different varieties of intensive care units, that all of them can be joined together, create a data pipeline, and you can put them in a command center. This is possible, and we are doing it. If you look at new services, new services do exactly that. So we can do it, and it's more regular, and people who are using it are more disciplined. So it is absolutely possible here. Now, how does, again, telemonitoring? We have a secure and rapid data storage. The data is stored immediately. Clinical notes can be maintained. We can reduce paperwork. So you can, you can imagine people wearing this entire PPEs with two gloves and the face mask and goggles and this large space suits trying to hold a pen and writing notes on the paper. It's impossible. A task that my friends tell me in the U.S., a task that normally takes three minutes becomes uh, because three seconds or ten, ten, ten seconds becomes three minutes to five minutes. That's the delay that people have to do because you lose the dexterity. And here, again, we can invoke data protection and maintain the Data Protection Act and see that data is not, uh, people don't steal data or that one person's data doesn't mix with the other because we are now realizing uh, that there is a lot of social uh, problems if you get a COVID-19 that people are having so are having inhibitions, social inhibitions of going to their home. You see doctors being assaulted. You find uh, dead bodies not being lifted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can actually protect data so the data doesn't leak. Or who's got what? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
the finally we can get online consent for trials and they can initiate and consent can be maintained for the next so many years and we can know what we can do and we can actually do an online counseling for these patients too so so who needs telemonitoring who needs telemonitoring see uh, monitoring patients from a distance and avoiding unnecessary this is what we call a tele triage so this gives us an opportunity to triage patients who are potentially got a tele uh, covid 19 or any other disease for the matter or who are potentially at a risk of getting covid 19 so we can monitor patients from a distance and avoid unnecessary visits to hospital it is interesting that the within a week of uh, the the first case um, that happened in america was in washington state and at the same time the first case happened in korea as well so when this patient came in everybody went into a huddle and the patient was completely monitored by intensive care carts where they had a camera they have a tablet and the patient was monitored and they they have been trying to do this and uh, most of the places the the federal government actually uh, released 500 million dollars to make people start doing telemedicine there all these days they wouldn't do it and they passed emergency legislations they released money for they for absolutely and they advised people to take up telemedicine now people on telemedicine are advised who should go to hospitals they keep vulnerable patients safe and the most important thing the <clears throat> the er is no longer the emergency room is not the emergency room that we felt it has changed into an icu so you have all sorts of patients arriving there patients with panic attacks patients having cough and cold uh, but thinking that they have got a covid 19 and all these patients can be triaged using a telemonitoring service so if you look at the world in general you have a set of people on the right side is Uh, the people who are in the community and the left side people who are at home and the hospital i'm sorry so the the first ones are the people who are the well and they are worried they have to be reassured but they have to be monitored to see if they convert the other set of people are the ones who are in isolation who are um, put in isolation because they are covid 19 positive and yet they are not sick enough to go to the hospital they can be isolated at home the other ones are the people who have been discharged and they are recuperating at home now this is an interesting problem because we now know even though it's not publicized that lot of patients are actually coming back to the hospital after getting so called cured uh, from covid 19 with pulmonary embolism and from deep vein thrombosis etc we do not yet know how many people are again retesting to be covid 19 just because you're cured and recuperating doesn't mean you are safe you're let loose into the community put back at home but you have to be monitored still so you escape the initial disease but you could have complications and the last one of set of people who are in transit people who are being transported who are proven covid 19 who are ill who are getting oxygen they are being transited and they are put into the uh, emergency room or into the hospital or went to the hospital ward so these are the patients who have to be monitored so that they don't and to see that they are not deteriorating on the way fundamentally because in the number of people allowed inside an ambulance is low most probably you might have just have the driver driving this patient down with the patient panting on oxygen at the back so it would be wonderful if we can actually monitor these patients and bring them to the hospital and help the driver who is there who is the sole must be the sole caregiver to those places we have to remember that an ambulance is a closed chamber and it is not a negative pressure environment finally we moved to the hospital on the left so you can actually monitor the patients in the emergency room in the wards where they are getting oxygen and not at into the intensive care unit and of course the intensive care unit too so this is where this entire telemonitoring can be utilized so how should we deploy telemonitoring telemonitoring deployment yeah, i call it carpe diem grasp it now this is the time so it is not difficult telemonitoring is not difficult we have the technology in place we have excellent technology in place then <clears throat> this is the time we just needs vision and will the people who are heading hospitals heading health services they should insist and they should get it there is money available 
we most of the equipment that is used and the software that is used to do telemonitoring is equipment agnostic it that means it is not specific for a particular piece of equipment it can be deployed very quickly and at this moment of time we do not need the best in the business technology the indian jugad can work virtually i can tell you uh, aharo princess alexandra hospital in aharo uses simple ipads inside the icu as well as iphones for people to communicate with each other with the doctors so the uh, patient's face the monitors everything is shown on tele on on a network using the um, ipads or iphones and it reduces the number of doctors entering into this icu and they are actually quite comfortable with it until they graduate to a more formal tele intensive care systems what is the summary the tele monitoring is feasible it is possible it can be deployed rapidly we have enough of satellite communication we have enough of 4g we have enough of 3g we have enough of internet if we can um, interminably uh, so what we call uh, push netflix and so many online video shows down i'm sure we can do a tiny bit of bandwidth because the amount of data that you actually send in a tele icu is actually very very small it's not much but if you can actually have an online streaming of high definition video and people are working from home which is much more and i am able to talk to you on to so many people on a zoom the requirement for this is just a fraction it can be deployed tele monitoring is feasible it can be deployed and it protects the scarce resource of the healthcare workers they are very scarce believe me people are afraid to go in we can handle the entire community we have we have already developed smart cities entire smart city can be managed everybody has got an arogya number we can actually uh, get those numbers we can pinpoint where those people are the it unifies treatment <clears throat> people will stop using unnecessary stupid treatments which are unproven we can actually unify the correct treatment and we can prevent fragmentation of data this is very very vital here we do not know why are people dying in maharashtra more than any other state why is nagaland not getting any cases so it's it's uh, it's it's a no brainer to think that in the present case scenario where you have so much of tech power and networking capacity that and you have intensivists who are highly trained and available to work you should protect them and give them the resources to fight this disease and to protect the population and unify the data so that the patient in in uh, um calcutta is treated the same way in chennai and in bangalore or in bombay or in the interiors of punjab so and the, all the data is brought to it and comparable day by day hour by hour as to which patient is doing well and not finally we do not know the long term effects of this virus what it will do to the population if getting a viral infection does will it cause any other problems in future we are blind we just have to wait and watch similarly we have to be remember it is unethical to deploy young medical students and doctors and healthcare workers to the war front when it can be avoided so preserve our doctors and we can do tele monitoring and it is possible thank you i'm open to questions uh right sir uh, thank you so much for this session sir i think great insights on telemedicine han and how it can be the need of the hour and how it's being used globally uh, especially during the current scheme of things so sir we have received quite a few questions uh, uh, from the participants i'll just okay. go through those yeah i'll just go through those sir one by one uh, so the first question is sir uh, how can these negative pressure and isolation rooms be created at such a short notice Uh, right it it's not difficult actually because um, it's a reverse air conditioning most of these air conditioning companies that um, that actually push air into the system can be modified to suck air out of the system too it's not a problem it can be done so it is again the will to do it rather than the um, the the read exists and it can be done it's not a problem if you can if you can change the air inside uh, an operating theater um for every 20 minutes uh, we can do that 
uh, again as well. So if, if the negative pressure is important because <clears throat> traditionally in the operating theaters, for example, we maintain a positive pressure. So that outside dirty air doesn't enter into the clean room. But the problem is the reverse here. You have to create a negative pressure so that the air from inside doesn't go out. It is possible it can be done and it can be deployed at short notice too. Yes, because we have the technology to do it. Next. That is the answer to your question? All right, sir. I think it most of it did. Uh, I'll just jump on to the next question. We have quite a few coming in, sir. So I'll try to squeeze in as much as I can. Uh, the next question is, sir, can telemedicine be used across all specialities in a healthcare system? If not, which are the ones where telemedicine has a limited scope? Right. Uh, all specialties is, um, I, I'm talking about acute, well, I know that most of the hospitals are now undertaking uh, tele-OPDs. So virtually most of the um, specialties, urology, infertility, gynecology, all of them for non-essential, non-acute services are already using telemedicine anyway. So they have been deployed and it is working quite fine and people are quite happy to do that. Um, so that, that takes care of it. Now, there are certain uh, problems like, uh, I do not know how ophthalmology can handle telemedicine uh, because you need to be pretty close up to the patient to examine the eye I don't think taking a photograph of the eye and sending it is going to help the ophthalmologist. So my, I do not know, but I think ophthalmology is one branch where you can't. But think, think, but conditions like antenatal care um, and uh, um, people being um, uh, pregnant women monitored at home, being advised, we can handle it that way. The other problems, of course, are what can be done. I mean. Uh, Things like cardiology, we can actually now are capable of sending a 12 lead ECG online uh, to a trained set of cardiologists who can opine what is happening. All this can be done. But um, to my opinion, the limitations to this are minimal. The advantages are phenomenal. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So the next one is, sir, that uh, what is the minimum equipment and parameters needed to be monitored from COVID-19 isolation point of view? If vitals, then which are the ones like ETCO2 or others which you like? No, to we don't need ETCO2. No, ET we, we need, uh, most of the people just need a pulse oximetry, a respiratory rate, and an ECG and saturation. That is all you need. That's the basic monitoring that is needed. And what is important is not about an absolute value, what we need to see is the trending values of things and that is where monitors come in. So taking a reading every five minutes or every four hours is not going to help because this is a rapidly changing disease. So having a continuous monitoring on these patients and getting displaying the trend data of these patients is more important. Let us, for example, say that respiratory rate is increasing and the oxygen saturation is slowly dropping. The diverse, uh, the, when the curves, two curves diverse, then it, 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 gives an indication the patient is deteriorating. Now, if it is not happening, the patient is stable. So the minimal requirements, I would say, would be an ECG, pulse oximetry, heart rate, um, and respiratory rate, which is the basic monitoring four parameters that you can monitor or any cheap monitor. That can be done. That's in isolation. But once they move into an intensive care unit, the monitoring steps up to another level altogether. They might need invasive blood pressure monitoring. They might need invasive um, carbon dioxide monitoring. They might need uh, more x-rays or they might need replacement therapy. And believe me, all these things can actually be monitored in a tele -IC. The dialysis machines can be monitored. The um, multi-parametric monitors can be monitored. The syringe pumps which keep the drugs to the patients can be monitored. So all these things can be actually seen. And the entire waveforms from the ventilators, the settings, etc., can be done. And you can imagine that if the whole thing is coming to one point, <clears throat> four intensive care to 10 intensive care people can actually sit together, confer, and decide which patient's treatment needs to be changed. So that, that is the requirement, and that is the strength of the study in tele monitoring services. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. I'll quickly jump on to the next question, which is, 
uh, how to understand and convince the clinical pathophysiology of a disease of overlapping systems. Are there any software programs available for such diseases? I am not aware, but I, I, common sense tells me that if you have to do it, you need data because that's where uh, you have to match two different sets of data. So, you know, until you have a constant stream of data coming in um, from coexisting diseases and overlapping diseases, only then you will be able to compare and say that this is working, that is not working. And that's where artificial intelligence comes in, I think, when you're dealing with a huge population of patients who are having allergic rhinitis, coughing because they have a common cold, or a spring catarrh, a running nose to a patient who has got um, a real COVID-19 pneumonia developing in him. So I'm not aware of any specific software. Maybe it is present if it is available. A lot of artificial intelligence data management systems are saying that they can deploy such um, uh, software which will match disease. But um, I don't know. I still will depend upon human intelligence to do it, but it needs data. Next. Right, sir. So the next question is, uh, for telemedicine, do you see it as a challenge in the medical legal system in India? If yes, what are the solutions for that? that that's a question that I definitely expected. Uh, the medical legal aspects uh, can be easily divided into, number one, the data protection, that data should not be stolen and misutilized. That is the medical legal thing, that somebody comes in, unauthorized person comes in, takes a video of the uh, data center or the uh, command center and puts it on a WhatsApp or something to show that person is ill. The second thing is that um, data is stolen and it is uh, made public so that people can be blackmailed for it. Misinformation. So all this comes under data uh, protection. The other one is the people being responsible for their acts. Um, many, there are two types of data that run. One is where you are completely looking after the intensive care unit, you do rounds and dictate a prog dictate a therapy or treatment. And in that case, you are responsible for that. The other one is purely advisory role, that there is a staff available in the intensive care unit who can actually manage these patients, but they eventually are responsible for the actions and you sit at a distant site and you give them advice as to what is happening because of the experience that you have. And you tell them, mentor them. So in that case, you are responsible for the advice that you give. And the people who are the working at the face, they are responsible for the actions that are committed. Your advice may be correct, and they may not take it. Your advice may be bad, and they may not take it. So it depends entirely on them as to what is happening. So this is where the medical legal comes in. But a fact remains is the new guidelines for telemedicine have just been released by the Telemedicine Society and the Union Government. So <clears throat> I would suggest people should go to the telemedicine website and take the course. A course is available in which you will be mentored through how you should take a consent and how one should look after that, because a consent is mandatory. If a patient gets admitted to an intensive care unit, which actually has a tele-ICU, he has consented. Whereas if we go and solicit, then both sides' consent should be taken. And importantly, that and the patient should know who is the doctor on the other side, and the doctor should know who is the patient on that side. I would encourage people to see the guidelines and uh, the law has been passed. The guidelines have been released and they are available at the Telemedicine Society website and they can be downloaded. Uh, right, sir. So the next question is, sir, what are the few apprehensions that small clinics have while setting up tele-ICU with a command center and how do you overcome those? Apprehensions are number one is the capital expenditure. They think it's going to be expensive. It is not. It is not expensive. Uh, networking is not expensive at all. <clears throat> so that is the first apprehension that we find that people say that it's going to be very, very expensive. We cannot uh, afford it. Um, it's actually affordable. It's, it's actually in the long run, it turns out to be cheaper. And it has been shown repeatedly that um, would you like to, there are certain places in the country where intensives are not available. 
but you have to run intensive care unit. Because if you don't have an, I'm talk, not talking about COVID-19, I'm talking about in general. So if you imagine a small hospital, which is working in a smaller town, uh, if this private hospital, the, the surgeons would not like to operate because you don't have a good intensive care backup. So the surgeon takes his patient to a higher center, as they call it, and the patient is operated there or he's looked after there. They spend more. And uh, what happens is the patients, the relatives travel there. They spend much more on their local requirements, transport, food, stay, etc., etc. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, if back home, this small hospital lost two things. One is the local um, respect that this hospital can actually treat these patients. And second thing is that the staff doesn't upgrade themselves because unless challenged human beings don't upgrade themselves. So what you have developed is a revenue leak because this patient did not get operated and went away somewhere else because you did not have quote unquote a good intensive care service. Now change it. You have a tele ICU and you have a series of intensivists sitting offsite to actually keep on helping out the people that are there and, and operating on them. Or let us say you had a surgeon who did a major surgery or he had unexpected blood loss. The patient had to be looked after for the night. He's nervous that who is going to, he or she is nervous, who is going to look after the patient in the night in this smaller hospital. But if the patient was on a tele-ICU, even if it is overnight, he can be managed, the doctor is informed, and people can be asked what to do about it. So we can stem the revenue leak that is there. So uh, this is actually at an advantage. So in the long run, you actually make up for the cost. It doesn't need, most of the monitors don't, uh, you don't need very high-tech monitors to do all this tele-ICU. And if the networking is not expensive. Networking is very cheap in India. And uh, distance is no longer an issue. The other uh, issue that they have uh, fear is that my patient um, data will be leaked off to some other hospital. Now you can actually bind people in a contract and see that it doesn't happen. And it's an individual thing. Um, I, I guess uh, people can always talk about patients elsewhere. But uh, once you're dealing with professional people, this does not happen. Next. Uh, right, sir. So the next question is that such solution, is it a need of R only during scenarios like COVID-19? Or should it be put into regular practice? Sometimes doctors then need more of physical touch mm -hmm. to ensure delivery of their care. Please help us with the perception of ICU doctor on this. Yeah. See, we are dealing with a centuries old thing that a physician actually should touch a patient to do it. We are seeing patients touching patients less and less. I mean, unfortunately, this epidemic or pandemic has shown that actually you don't need physical touching to look after people. It's possible. The same thing was proven during the Ebola crisis in Africa that you don't actually need to be in constant touching patients in order to see it. Technology is good enough. You don't even need a stethoscope now. You have fantastic stethoscopes which transmit data, transmit heart sounds, transmit respiratory data beautifully over the line. And people are quite happy to get it done that way. So we have to, which is changing, it is a paradigm change in the way people look at it. For centuries, people have gone through this including our teachers, and we were trained that way, that a doctor, unless he is at the bedside, he cannot treat people. But it's no longer true. You can still treat people. Of course, there is a requirement for doctors to be with the patient, touch, to them, touch them, talk to them, speak to them, have a very good bedside manner. But to a large extent, we can do without all that and protect healthcare personnel. So it doesn't need to be COVID-19 to need a tele-ICU, but you can still... Even even without touching a patient, you can treat them. Lots and lots of patients are treated online on a um, on a tele OPD basis. So they don't seem to regret it. They seem to be okay with that. Next, uh, right, sir. So the next question is that given what telemedicine can do, don't you think it would become counterproductive to the doctor community? as the doctor then becomes just an input provider and, and like you mentioned, the treatment would come from telemedicine command center. And what is the role of a local doctor other than being a facilitator? The doctor is definitely the boss there. 
because he has the right to say no to a particular treatment that is being given if he thinks for example if i am at the command center and i am utopian and i suggest a very expensive investigation but the local doctor thinks that it doesn't need to be done he can overrule the decision there is absolutely no issues it happens all the time and the same thing can happen but still the patient is still that particular doctor's patient he doesn't belong to the command center because the patient is still admitted under that particular physician and doctor the the, the the healthcare service it is a distant they are sitting there and seeing it's an overall view of what is happening so that the, for imagine you have a physician who has got a, a pneumonia not covid 19 a normal pneumonia patient admitted in the ic but the physician also has to do his opds he can't sit at the intensive care all the time so he can be this patient can be monitored in a tele icu and the physician informed as to what is the changes that are occurring and if he approves the treatment that is being offered to him so i think it's perfectly fine the doctor does not lose importance in fact his importance is improved because there is he or she has the power to negate a particular decision taken by a tele icu next right sir so the next question is that is it true that the ventilator is the last resort for the covid 19 patients or do you think managing the ventilator remotely can help in managing the critically ill better at this moment of time the none of the ventilators that are available with us in india can be remotely managed they are managed on site physically we can only suggest changes in the settings of the ventilator and somebody has to do it physically there are only a very few ventilators where the screen can actually be moved out of the room so that you can actually change the parameters um, but uh, not from a very distant site you have to be physically present to change it that will change in future when uh, when apps will be for example puritan when it uh, uh, has produced an app where you can actually change the settings on the ventilator from a phone no uh, that that's uh, then uh, the think ge also can allow things to happen but at this moment there are very few of them i don't know if they're still available in india but you have to restart the whole system in a different way the last resort we do not know it appears to be but this moment of time though uh, it's uh, lot of patients on ventilators are dying abroad so we do not know if it's actually the last last resort next question please right sir so the next question is that the current crisis demands the approach of telemedicine uh, to be much more viable how do you see the demand for telemedicine will be carried forward post covid scenario i think it's a comfort um, once um, let us say there is a hospital which has a small nine bedded five bedded intensive care unit the physicians are always up and about wondering what is happening but if they know that somebody is actually there oversight looking after the patient and telling them if something else is going wrong it is i think a sense of peace of mind as well so it is uh, it's like a drug i mean once you have um, a system you will get accustomed to it earlier we used to give anesthesia without monitors and um, we now without a monitor people don't give anesthesia so you can imagine now uh, that uh, if this is the same thing this is just an extended monitor why are we worried and it's an intelligent monitor because there is a human being sitting at that end of it constantly watching what is happening so uh, if this is an educated uh, group of people who will help out and i think uh, this is a very viable thing after this covid-19 pandemic and disaster is coming after it finishes if whenever it does so you will have these systems and they will become better and more robust and people will become important and the most important thing is once if the uh, public sector or the government health services actually deploy tele icu uh, what do we have till now suddenly we realize that the government hospitals don't have very good intensive care units they have but they are not very good to handle this sort of problems 
So once you develop tele ICU and there are people recruited who can sit and watch through the whole system, they will also become more efficient and they will of course be viable. And obviously the cost of it has to come down. So it is going to live after the COVID-19 dies. Next. Right, sir. So the next question is that what are the, some of the key requirements to consider for a new hospital project so that they can digitize and connect at some point even if they don't have plans to invest in digital solutions immediately. Right. Um, now, this is something uh, I have seen when we went around um, looking to provide, providing tele-intensive care services. That virtually most of the hospitals do not have a networking point near the beds. So when I request and suggest that whenever you're planning a hospital, plan just as you plan plug points, plan networking points at each bedside. That is a minimum mandated requirement. Uh, Wi-Fi may not work, may fail. You can have data direct dropouts, but having a wired connection actually helps and keeps everything secure. The other thing I would say is that when you buy monitors, please buy monitors that are networkable um, or network enabled, I would say. It might be slightly more expensive than without it, but in the long run, when you it's going to make a lot of difference. So that when you want to step in into a, an intensive tele-intensive care, there everything is in place. All you have to do is to plug in a computer and hire a networking or hire a tele ICU service like ours. So it is it is this is the minimum mandatory thing is that when you are building an ICU, put networking points at each bed, a minimum of two, and create. Uh, a system whereby you can actually place a server uh, safely in your hospital if need be. This is what is important. The last and the most other important thing is that please invest in a, an, a very good internet connection. It's, it's now cheap and we can put it up. And these things, they can draw any fiber content and we can actually, the uh, data can be pushed very quickly until when satellite becomes cheaper. Till then we can continue to use it. This is my advice for a new hospital. Then buy monitors, again, which are networkable or network enabled, so that you can actually immediately connect up as and when necessary. Now, th this is interesting because uh, suddenly if you have your intensivist leaving your hospital or somebody, a lot of couple of you people went on leave and you do not have enough of intensivists to cover the intensive care unit, you don't go around scrambling looking for intensivists. You already have the network connected. You can temporarily hire an intensive care uh, set of people who run a tele ICU to monitor in the interim till you get a new intensivist. So it makes a lot of difference to have this network enabled. And of course, the the this is the the tele ICU is the cheapest way in which you can make electronic medical records. If you want to deploy an entire hospital-wide electronic medical record, and that takes data. So we should understand most of the software suck data from the monitor, and you don't have to chart it anymore. All that goes in, and all prescriptions can be made into that. So you have electronic medical records always available. And doesn't need much of expensive hardware to run it to. Next. Right, sir. So the next question is that, are you involved in the treatment part also? in case of critically ill patient? For example, if the patient warrants IL-6 inhibitor, if yes, how would you monitor the devices during the transit of the patient? When you are actually monitoring, you're looking at the physiological parameters, isn't it? This COVID-19 therapy, it doesn't say that you don't need intensive insight. It says that reduce the amount of exposure of healthcare workers to the disease as much as possible. This is one way which you do it. Still, people have to be intubated. So the chances of what the effects of IL-6 treatment, whether they are being or not, you need specialists. I mean, if you look at the hospitals in New York and uh, other places where they are actually using therapy, whether steroids should be used or not, there are one set of doctors who who do nothing but intubation, one set of doctors who do nothing except proning people, and there's the other set of doctors who actually don't go and see the patient at all. They actually sit and look at the 
data, the ferritin levels, they, they look at the um, what they call the CRP levels, they look at the hemoglobin, and they initiate the therapy online. And they say, well, these patients should get steroids, these people should get this therapy. And those, that team com consists of in physicians as well as rheumatologists who are experts at handling the immune system. So it is it is going to be an effort on so many uh, so many people on so many fronts. That is how this is working at the moment. Clear demarcation of duties. There's an expertise in everything. Does that answer the question? Right, sir. It does to a, a good amount of extent. So the next question is that how many critical beds in a particular system can be connected to a command center uh, like yours? And what are the legal binding on the command center for this? The answer to that, see, I know my friends running tele-intensive care units abroad in America, where they are monitoring uh, 50 intensive care units. <clears throat> Each intensive care unit has got 10 bits, that means 500 bits. So once a particular console um, is now saturated, or we decide that a particular intensivist can handle only 15 to 20 patients, we we have to set up another console where they will be monitored again. So there is no limit. This people, it's no longer uh, an intensive care unit of a hospital. It is one big intensive care unit in the sky. You don't think of intensive care units, you think of beds. So it is limitless. It is just limited by your bandwidth. It is limited by the number of intensivists you have on site uh, to handle this patient. So um, how many is a matter of question as to what is the bandwidth available and how many intensive intensivists are there at the command center to handle it. We have the capacity to handle 150 patients now, but we can rapidly deploy and increase it. Does that answer? Right, sir. So the next question is related to data privacy, sir. I think you've answered in, in, in one of the questions, but I think there's a lot of questions with relation to data privacy and how it's ensured that the data for the patients uh, stored and, and there's privacy for the data. Okay, absolutely. See, <clears throat> let me answer this question in general terms. I suppose it will answer many of these queries. First and foremost is that there is a data protection act you have to store the data within the geographical confines of this country. We cannot put servers outside this country. The servers have to live inside this country. Data has to be stored, well, I think, for nearly five, ten, five years or seven years and uh, more if you have children. And this data has to be absolutely private and the data belongs to the patient. It doesn't belong to me or to you or anybody. What now... The security is as much as if you can run banks and people can actually run your banking on your mobile phones, there is no reason why and, no, and your data is being predicted. I think billions of amounts of money is being transferred online as we speak. People are not going out of their home. So much of uh, money is being transferred all over the world and it's being done online. And of course, you will always, there are hackers um, lurking there to take control over your system. But the fact remains is that you have to choose um, the pitfall of most of the tele ICU systems is that the medical portion is very strong, but the networking portion is not very strong. What we invested in is a networking expert who used to um, who used to deal with cryptocurrency. You can't be more secure than that. So you have to have your data uh, reflected in many servers at the same time. So that if your data, if your server comes down or it falls or something happens to it, the data should be available at different vertical sites. For example, you let us say you had um, your data stored in Bombay <clears throat> and there were floods. It doesn't mean that you don't have access to the data or the server room gets flooded. The data should immediately also be available in Chennai or in Calcutta or in Dehradun or in Nagpur for the matter. So you need that strength to maintain and run um, those server uh, capacities to keep, keep the data secure, not only secure, but available all the time, up and running, whatever it is. So these, uh, these have to be regularly certified. And not only that, we 
uh, we actually, um, there are companies that do uh, certify you by doing ethical hacking and they tell you what's happening to your servers and how penetratable they are. All the places that we work in our command centers run on physical firewalls, uh, two, not one. So it's difficult, quite difficult to penetrate. And there is a person 24 hours by seven available who's constantly monitoring the networks to see that uh, nothing, nobody's penetrating it. Yes, there will be attempts. If you have a network, people are there who will try to do it. So choose your next, choose the next, the, before you ask for a tele, uh, intensive care service, you have to see the strength, not just about the clinicians who are running it, but also the strength of the networking capacities of the people and the capability of these people to keep your data secure. Um, the possibility exists of actually keeping our data available for the hospital and a server also, so that the data is there. We follow a policy that once a patient is discharged, uh, the entire document is emailed to the hospital, whom the way they can store it, keep it and print it for themselves. That is what we do. So the strength is not just in our set of intensivists, but the strength is also in the networking capacity that there are people who are fully capable of running it and we get it regularly certified. We get it regularly certified by ethical hacking to see that our data networks are not penetrated so that nobody goes and sits in the data and holds it for ransom that unless you transfer 1 million cryptocurrency units, you will not get your data back. No, we prevent it from happening. Because we know that our portal will be the entry of the hackers into the system of that hospital. So there is a lot of maturity in what we are doing. And this is what I think we have taken advice and this is what we do. The people experienced in data networking security should be people involved in it. It's not just taking two wires, uh, cables and plugging it in and watching Netflix, isn't it? Does it answer your question? Uh, yes, it does, sir. So I understand we are on top of the hour, sir. With your permission, can I take last two questions and then we can wrap uh, up? Sure. Please, sir. Sure. sure, sir. So the question is that, do I understand right that you are primarily suggesting episodic slash reactive care rather than continuous and proactive care with telemedicine? No, I'm suggesting continuous care. I'm not ever suggesting flash proactive care. I'm saying that people should be monitored continuously just as you would do an intensive care unit. That is what intensive care units supposed. There is no difference in actually doing a physical intensive care or tele-intensive care. It goes on. Patients are monitored. You do rounds twice, thrice a day. Check on investigation. See that a particular investigation difference has been acted upon. A particular... Uh, 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 a blip in the data is checked, rechecked, and see that it's correlated clinically. It is not episodic. It is continuous. Episodic is when you do not have an intensivist in an intensive care unit. That becomes episodic. Here it is continuous. Somebody is watching and sitting and watching the screen and doing nothing else. A formal handover and takeover is done, and it is done uh, clinically and on... on, on, on uh, uh, and it, there's a formal sign in and sign out on using the software. That is what we do. Right, sir. Next to next last question. Yeah, sir. So last question is considering what you've shared for smaller cities uh, which don't have intensivists, shouldn't this become mandatory in smaller cities where quali qualified people are not there? And how can we create more awareness about these services in tier two, tier three towns? I think if somehow somebody can actually explain to the tier two, tier three hospitals and to the <clears throat> population per se that uh, how this is going to help them. Uh, for example, people actually come to the hospital and say, do you have a cardiologist? Do you have an intensive care unit? People should ask that if you don't, if you have an intensive care unit, do you have an intensive? If you don't have an intensive, is it connected to telemedicine? This is what people should be made aware about. I think the general public, uh, for them, um, the demand should come from the people. That is important. They should become aware that I want my patient to be monitored. I feel safer. The other thing is that the hospital should be made aware about the uh, revenue leak that they are having because of the lack of a good intensive care cover. This is important because 
uh, there's a huge and they're not only in quality not only in um, uh, services but also in the quality of service as well because every time you admit a patient in the intensive care unit the entire staff learns so you become better every time you have a sick patient in the hospital and they are discharged you learn from your success you learn from your mistakes so the general quality of that hospital becomes better the local population gets uh, more confidence in that hospital and they would rather go to your local uh, hospital rather than to travel to a larger city a faceless person so this is i think very very important and this is how we can convince people that your people will gain more confidence in your hospital and they would like to be treated here instead of moving away because patient moving away to another place to get treated it's not just the patient being treated it is the local economy that suffers as well he goes away i mean his daily uh, daily earning is lost so everything yeah, every throws everything out of gear so i'm sure this is uh, they can be convinced it is it is a fear that it is going to be expensive no it's not it's not going to be expensive you you because it is going if we it was expensive tele icu will never would have happened the world knows and america has seen now europe is seeing sweden knows that it is cheaper actually to run a tele intensive care unit than to have full time staff over there which when they have no work so if you have a tele icu like the formal previous question if you, whenever you have patients you can look at the tele icu when you don't have patients you don't run it this is what i would say any more questions right sir uh, thank you so much sir for this session today i think it was very enlightening and thank you so much for being My so pleasure. patient everybody stay safe wear masks mm. right sir thank you for being patient and asking those thank you sir thank you so much sir thanks you're welcome thank you bye right